Hi, this is Dan Coffin, owner of SPNC and certified professional agronomist. And one of the big questions this year, just because of the price, but literally every year, is how much dry P and K should I use? Should I just be using maintenance levels? Should I be trying to raise the soil test levels of my soil? And when is enough enough? And when is too much too much? Well, that's a that's a tiptoe through the tulips, if you will, because oftentimes people blame me for or accuse me, not blame me, but accuse me of being anti-fertilizer. Trust me, we sell fertilizer products around here all the time. We are not anti-fertilizer. We're pro-fertilizer, otherwise I wouldn't have a business. But the bottom line is understanding the soils and the soil types and the crops that you're growing and what makes them grow and how they function, uh, as well as the, the CEC of your soil and the pieces of the puzzle from years of testing and understanding the difference between just raw pounds and percent base saturation, which would be percent K, um, or on the phosphate side, is it, uh, is, is, it, is it red in parts per million on your test? And that say uh, 30 parts per million, where in a soil, if it's 30 parts per million, you multiply that parts per million number times two, and 30 parts per million would be 60 pounds per acre. And then you can get a copy of the university recommendations and what those numbers really mean in terms of high, very high, medium, low, very low. You could figure that out. But is all that really necessary? Well, it's something that we should evaluate, but no, it's not as critical as it seems because what I found out through all the years of, of doing this is um, getting close is in some cases close enough. If you have a better balance and you are... Uh, for instance, in the soils around here that might have a, a CEC of anywhere from 7 to 15, or if you jump up into the heavy clay loams, 15 to 20 or 25, um, or if it's in sands, uh, you know, 7 and below. If you're, if you're in those sands, if you have 2.5% base saturation or higher, typically, which is going to you know, we're going to show you on a test of, of, a, of a high hundreds or low 200s in terms of pounds, um, and if you're in those moderate ranges, seven to 15, and you're showing somewhere around 2.2% base saturation, which is going to keep between two and 300 pounds, or if you're in the real heavy CECs, the clay loams or clays, and, and you're running, uh, 250 to 300 or more pounds per acre, it's enough. Uh, the hardest part is we're trying to think in our mind, if we raise these soil test levels up into the really high categories and keep them there all the time, nothing's ever going to go wrong and we'll always make the best crop. And for potash, that's not exactly true, because what we find is beans do need a fair amount of potassium. And if you were going to do that business of trying to oversupply potash to your soils, you should really put it on the beans and let the corn have the rest. Unless you thought I was thinking too fast or talking too fast, then I said that in reverse. I did not. If you're going to put on a two or 300 pound application of potassium, you should put it on before soybeans and let corn have the rest. Why? Because what people don't recognize is in the world of, of corn and all grasses, whether it's sorghums or barleys or wheats or, or even grass in your yard, all grasses suffer with a problem called luxury consumption. And they tend to, when there's too much potash around, draw that potash into themselves. And what they do is they create an imbalance that does not allow the plant to bring in as much nitrogen as it should, as an ammonium form of nitrogen. And ammonium forms of nitrogen are what are key to help setting your ear size in this particular case, if it was sorghum, it would be a head or you know a grain head or whatever. It's, it's going to keep you from making your total top in because you're creating a nitrogen efficiency when the corn plant is this tall, and that's when it sets its ear. So what it won't do is keep you from making a good crop. It just keeps you from making a great crop because it's oversupplied. So from that standpoint, when people call me and ask me for a a free second opinion, or if they're saying, hey, okay, you're gonna, we're going to work with you. Here's your soil. Here's our soil test. What do you say? Probably 80 to 90% of the time, I'm telling them potash isn't really necessary. Um, and we might do that for one, two, or even five years. And I've had people that have gone as many as 20 years without potash. And most people would say, that's why you're anti-fertilizer. And I said, no, it, it, it just depends on the soils and some of the soils that you find around here. The soils here in the Fort Wayne area and south and a little bit around us and even over into the to the Lake, uh, Lake Erie Glacial Lake Plain, they're based on Eli clays and Eli clays are loaded with potassium. And as they shrink and swell, they release boatloads of potassium year in and year out. So whatever little bit you put out here as a pittance, 100 or 150 or 200 pounds in the big picture, when there's up as high as 55,000 pounds per six to eight inches of soil in the surface, 
That's one reason why we can't raise the soil test levels. It's just not, not enough to make a move. And so as a result, we don't recommend nearly as much potassium. And we have a number of growers who are on the high yielding programs with some of the major program companies out here that, and you know them by name, I don't have to mention them, that are, that are looking at the numbers on the soil tests and then the tissue analysis. And we've had a number of them come to us because they're chasing the numbers. But what we find is just chasing numbers without understanding how or why the crop's growing isn't answering the question. If you don't understand what the numbers mean or what they're useful for, if you just try to keep the numbers in an operating range, does it make a difference? And sometimes it does, but very rarely uh, does it make the major differences. That's not the issue. And so we don't recommend as much uh, potash. Uh, as a result, the same thing with phosphate. Phosphate, there are thousands of pounds of minerals in the soil around here and even, even in the sands. The sands typically have more phosphate uh, oftentimes than the mineral soils do. And so biology is what causes release of the phosphate to the greatest extent. So anything you do to enhance the soil biology, whether it be with manures or food sources and live biology and certain types of, of bacteria, fungi, and uh, actinomycetes, they're designed to respond to signals being given off by the plant all the time that I need phosphate. And uh, when they send out those signals, those microbes are there to receive them and send back a signal saying, hey, yes, I'm a phosphate releasing organism. Send me a root, give me some sugars, some amino acids, some, some proteins or peptides from your roots, your food sources, if you will. I'll take care of your phosphate needs. And lo and behold, you know, roots show up and phosphate comes up and, and phosphate goes into the plant. I can tell you as a certified professional agronomist working all over the country um, since 1991 as a certified and five or six years prior to that, I have probably only seen five, five legitimate phosphate deficiencies in my entire life. Um, and probably three of those were induced by old carryover chemistry that just kept the roots from growing properly and the plants turned purple. And when we went in there and foliar fed that crop and raised the phosphate levels initially, even though the same soils with low phosphate were there, the phosphate deficiency went away and it never came back. So phosphate is probably one of the most overutilized inputs in agricultural production. Doesn't make it bad. Didn't hear that here. It does not make it bad. It's just expensive to use. And because most of it goes out as dry fertilizer, it's dotted every little bit of places everywhere. And it's just a very inefficient system. It can work. We've used it for years. And when we keep those numbers up, we sleep better at night. But the reality of it is because phosphate is a, a, a phosphorus with four oxygens around it, PO4, and it has a three minus charge it ties up micronutrients very, very readily. So if there's way too much phosphate in the soil, it's looking, it's, it's a very unstable ion and it's looking to, to marry up with something to make it stable again. And so two phosphate ions with a three minus charge would be a total of six minus charges. That's gonna tie up three micronutrients that have a plus two, because three twos would make six, you got two three. So they, they balance each other out. So in the world of chemistry, all it is is pluses and minuses and even numbers. And so in that case, three phosphate ions would tie up three micronutrients of any kind. So when you have high pHs that cause micronutrient tie up and you have lots of phosphate, your main problem in those situations is micronutrient deficiency. And so we've gone to farm after farm that have utilized P and K for years through manures. And the very first thing we do is introduce micronutrients to their system and they are stunned at the productivity quotient change. The other thing is if, if they got that much potash is we don't recommend any potash. If you do want to put on potash, 150 pounds in most cases in most Midwestern soils in conjunction with the potash that you have left in the soil and any foliar potash that you want to put on, whether it be from, from ethylene inhibitors that have some potash or potassium acetate or potassium thiosulfate, all of those are additive. And so there are so many neat and unique programs with the equipment that we have today and the way we approach agriculture that we can make a major difference in the way the crop grows. So P and K, somebody said P and K pays the way. Well, that's fine. Uh, but if you want to use make P and K pay the way, if you'll find out ways to do things in furrow, in bands or foliar feeding um, at different times, you'll probably pay more efficiently. So if you have questions on how that system might work and what a program might look like for you, get a hold of us here at SPNC. You can find it. Find us at uh, spncorp.com, two Cs, or you can dial in here to the main office or any one of the salespeople. The number here at the main office is 260-478-8080.